yesterday morning session the second part of the morning session we began our discussion of the second law of thermodynamics and this session we will be continuing with that what we did yesterday if you look up our scheme of discussion from main topic 9 the second law we have uh, discussed i think the first eight points we have decided to define a higher temperature and a lower temperature and that we did by deriving from deriving beginning from the kelvin planck statement that a 2t heat engine will work only in one direction given two reservoirs at two distinct temperatures and heat will flow on its own between two reservoirs uh, at two distinct temperatures only in one direction okay. and we look at that direction and the source we say as higher temperature the sink we say is the lower temperature so that way our definition of higher and lower temperatures is established one should note that the higher and lower temperatures decided here are thermodynamically higher and lower temperatures they need not be higher and lower numerically on any given scale however to be consistent with the thermodynamic higher and lower scales all our thermodynamic uh, all our temperature scales uh, to begin with historically and now formally of course now we don't have a multiplicity of temperature scale we only have one temperature scale and that is the kelvin scale uh, we know that our kelvin scale is based on some material an idealized material called an ideal gas but now it is time to put that scale on a proper footing which we will do in item 11 of chapter 9 yesterday's discussions pertained only to the direct derivations from kelvin planck statement and they only considered what is possible and what is not possible okay and we know that using that we can show that many simple processes as working of a 2t heat engine between two thermal reservoirs uh, working of or direct transfer of heat between two systems at two distinct temperatures just possibility or impossibility now we come to a stage where we start quantifying this this possibility and impossibility will soon be converted to greater than or equal to or less than or equal to and for that we have to come to a most important theorem in the development of second law which perhaps is typically most important because that was proposed by carnot and uh, is today considered perhaps the first set of thoughts pertaining relating or leading finally to the second law of thermodynamics now we come to an important adjective see we started with adjectives like quasi static then we said an adjective like adiabatic the next adjective was diathermal okay then isothermal and now the next adjective we are going to look at is reversible reversible is an adjective which like quasi static is applicable to processes so we will define a reversible process and naturally since a cycle is also a process later on we will apply it to a reversible cycle and since many pieces of equipment particularly an engine 
is implement engine implements a cycle. So, we will apply it to an engine, but the first thing to realize is what is a reversible process. Okay. Let me tell you that similar to a quasi static process, a reversible process is defined a process which we can think about. You can say that it is a uh, remember Einstein proposed experiments which, which can be about which we can think so called thought experiment. Experiments can be thought about may be very difficult to implement or perhaps even impossible to implement them in practice. So, similarly a quasi static process is a process about which we can think about. So, quasi static process perhaps is a thought process in a similar manner a reversible process is a process which we can think about. So, it also is a thought process. A reversible process is a very special kind of process. Okay. Let us say that we have two systems system A and system B. And let there be some interactions between them of any kind. And because of these interactions, state A 1, state A executes a process from A 1 to A 2 with some detail, may be a path. B executes a process B 1 to B 2 with its appropriate path. Now, if it is possible for this to occur, change of state of A 1 to A 2 through an appropriate path perhaps, interaction I with respect to B, which simultaneously goes from B 1 to B 2. If this process is possible and if the inverted process that is a process in which A 2 goes back to its state original state A 1, B 2 goes back to its original state B 1 and all interactions are reversed. I may not show it with a reverse arrow, but I will say reversed or inverted or you can even put minus i. This is also possible. Okay. Such that let us say this is process P and this is process Q, just labels. When P is executed, it has some detail. When Q is executed, all those details are inverted, reversed, take place in the other direction. In such a manner, when P followed by Q is executed, no trace remains. That we first executed the process P followed by the process Q. List out all your favorite detectives, Sherlock Holmes, Karamchand, some, some Jasus, all the heroes in CID, Hercule Pyre, Poirot, okay. bring all of them together. If a reversible process is executed in one direction and is reversed, everything comes back to its original state. All interactions get reversed. If any third system comes into the picture during the process and changes its state, even that state is reversed. Absolutely no evidence is left, no trace remains that the process was ever executed and then reversed. Okay. So, that means if I have some system and it changes its state and comes back to its original state by executing a pair of reversible processes, then there is no way I can determine whether the systems involved have ever left their original state or not. It is a very strict requirement and we know that all 
processes in real life take place in such a way that some trace or the other is left, some evidence is left, circumstantial otherwise whatever type. Okay. But if a reversible process is executed and is reversed so that the systems involved are brought back to their initial state then the interactions are also reversed to such detail that absolutely no trace ever remains that the processes were executed. So, that is a definition of a reversible process and now remember we have a general process, then we have a quasi static process. And now we have defined a reversible process. Anything happens in real life is a process. Quasi static process is a model, helps us with our analysis, and we know that it takes great effort to process to make a process quasi static, but many real life processes can be approximated to be quasi static. A reversible process is also a model, but to execute a process in a reversible fashion perhaps it is just impossible in real life, because in real life absolutely nothing is reversible. So, this is something which we will think about and we will use in our analysis, but there is a big question mark about whether a process is ever uh, will ever be executed as a reversible process. The advantage of defining a reversible process is something which we will soon see. In fact, we do not really have to worry about the reversibility of a process. The idea of a reversible process is used just to derive certain relations which finally lead us to the definition of entropy and many useful tools. So, consider the reversible process as a limiting case of a real process. And it is the limit or these limiting cases that we are going to study. Later on we will again have to think about when we derive property relations, but how to execute at least in theory or in our mind a reversible process, because that would lead us to certain relations between property, the basic relation in property. Okay. Till we do that, it is enough for us to understand that a reversible process is such that you trigger it, it executes one way, trigger it, it gets executed in the reversed way. By inverting, reversing or executing in the other direction all interactions that have taken place in the forward direction. So, that if we execute it in the forward direction once and if you execute it in the reverse direction once, the sum effect is absolutely nothing, no trace of the ex forward execution followed by reverse, ex reverse execution ever remains. Okay. Now, consider a 2 T engine which is reversible and let us say that if we trigger it, tap it, it will execute one cycle. Now, suppose I have two taps, one way if I tap it, it executes the cycle in the forward direction producing a positive amount of work. If it is a reversible engine, I must be able to tap it maybe with my left hand, so that it executes the cycle in the other direction, absorbing the same amount of work exactly in the same fashion. It rejected Q 2 to the low temperature reservoir, it would absorb exactly the amount Q 2 from the low temperature reservoir and reject it Q 1 as reject heat Q 1 to the high temperature reservoir. So, that if this happens one forward cycle and one reverse cycle, when we are away from the engine and then if we look at the engine, there is no way for us to say whether the engine was absolutely doing nothing or it executed one forward cycle and one reverse cycle, because 
no trace at all is left from reservoir T1 heat Q1 was absorbed in one part in one uh, forward cycle Q1 was rejected to it in the reverse cycle same thing Q2 was made available to the reservoir at T2 Q2 was absorbed from the reservoir at T2 and no trace is left in the reservoirs T1 and T2. Similarly, the work produced would have been absorbed in some third system, maybe in the rays of a weight or whatever. So, that also is absorbed back and the third system is also brought back to its original uh, state without any trace being left. So, if you understand this, that is all that is needed for us to use the defined tool known as a reversible process. Now, if you have understood what is meant by a reversible process, the next step is to say that a reversible cycle is a cycle that consists of all reversible processes. And if this cycle is implemented in an engine, that becomes a reversible engine. Now we come to the most important derivation or one of the most important derivation known as the Carnot theorem. Now, from this point onwards, I am going to follow the procedure but some details I will leave for you to fill in because these details are well described and well derived in almost all books on thermodynamics. The Carnot theorem states that the situation which considered in Carnot theorem is the following. We have two reservoirs at temperatures T1 and T2 and it is given to us that T1 is thermodynamically higher than T2. After yesterday's definition, we can now confidently say that two temperatures will be such that one is higher than the other. That means, if I try to run a 2 T engine between T 1 and T 2, it will work in this fashion it will absorb Q 1 from the reservoir at T 1, reject Q 2 at the reservoir at T 2 and produce a positive quantity of work W. The quantities shown in these derivations are positive in the direction which is shown. So, Q 1 is heat transferred from reservoir at T 1 to the engine, Q 2 is the heat transferred from the engine to the reservoir at T 2 and W is the positive amount of work delivered by the engine to some other system which absorbs it. Carnot compared the efficiency of such an engine with that of a reversible 2 T heat engine working between the same two reservoirs, but in a reversible fashion. That means, let us say that this is Q 1 for the reversible engine this is Q 2 for the reversible engine and this is W for the reversible engine. The engine E is not claimed to be reversible, it could be any engine, but this engine is reversible engine. So, if this engine can work only in one direction, this engine can be made to work in that direction producing positive uh, amount of work equal to W R. But that engine can also be made to work in the reversed direction, if there is any meaning in the direction, then the same amount of W R will be absorbed by the engine, Q 
q 2 r will be absorbed from the reservoir at T 2, q 1 r will be delivered at the reservoir at T 1. And if we execute the engine uh, reversible engines processes once in the forward direction and once in the reverse direction, absolutely no trace would be left that it ever occurred. And that is the meaning of the reversible engine. Now, the Carnot's theorem states that under these conditions, the efficiency of this engine, let us say eta and the efficiency of this engine, say eta r, eta must be less than or equal to eta r. that is the Carnot's theorem. Okay. And how do you prove the Carnot's theorem? I will just give you the idea of the proof, because the proof is well known. We say it is standard technique reductio ad absurdum. If this is what we have to prove, then all that we say let the opposite of this be true. That means, we say let us assume that eta is greater than eta r. So, again let me sketch it here. Now, let us do something. We will use our premise that thermodynamics is scale independent. So, we can always adjust the working of these engines in such a way that let us say some two uh, parameters are equal. Now, in the previous slide, I said let the heat flows be q 1, q 2 for the engine and q 1 r and q 2 r for the reversible engine. Okay. And let us uh, assume that W is the work output of the engine and W R is the work output of the reversible engine. What we can do is, let us assume that we adjust our Q 2 and Q 2 R to be the same. This is one way of doing it. You can assume Q 1 and Q 1 R to be the same. You can assume for example, q 2 and q 2 r to be the same. So, q 2 r and q 2 are the same. Let this be q 1 r and let this be w. Now, what you should do and this is the proof uh, in textbook. So, I will not spend time on it. You reverse the reversible engine take this in the other direction. So, this engine will absorb q 2 r, this is w r I forgot to write here. It will absorb work w r and it will reject q 1 r to the high temperature reservoir then combine the engine and the reversible engine. And maybe extend that idea to this, include the reservoir at T 2. Now, see what is happening. We have a cyclic device, we have an engine and a reversed engine together. We have a reservoir, but the reservoir 
absorbs heat Q2 and the reservoir also rejects heat Q2 because we have said that let Q2 be equal to Q2 R. Now, what do you notice that what you have is a modified engine which is E plus R reversed plus the reservoir at T 2. Okay. What is the net interaction? The net interaction is work produced would be W minus W R. And what is the heat absorbed from the reservoir at T 1? Q 1 by the engine and supplied back Q 1 R by the reversed engine, reversed reversible engine as I have shown R in US. Now, I am not going through the algebra because all of you know how to do that. Now, show that it can be shown that given this, it turns out that W minus W R is greater than 0. From this, this implication turns up. Just use this and you will be able to show that W minus W R equals 0. What does this mean? This means that there is a violation of the Kelvin Planck statement. And violation of Kelvin Planck statement means a violation of the second law of thermodynamics. And why does it get violated? We must have assumed something wrong. And the only assumption which we have made is this assumption. And that means this assumption is wrong. Hence, we prove that the original thing must be true. This is the proof of the Carnot theorem. Various textbooks have derived it in a different way. Some will assume Q2 equal to Q2R, adjust it that way. You can also derive it by assuming Q1 equals Q1R. Then you will get a 1T heat engine with T 2 as the reservoir, T 1 will get consumed in this 1 T purported 1 T heat engine. Whichever way you choose, you will finally come to a conclusion that assuming eta to be greater than eta r leads to a violation of the second law as stated by the Kelvin-Planck statement. So, we come to the first conclusion, which we have proved eta less than or equal to eta r for fixed T 1, T 2. And remember that for this, we have considered only so called 2 T heat engine. Now, that is a very special case of uh, engines and cycles also which are special as implemented in 2T heat engines. Now, let us proceed by look at some corollaries of Carnot theorem. There is one major corollary of Carnot theorem, although we can have a number of corollaries. And the most important corollary of the Carnot theorem is this. Let us again have our two reservoirs, 
t 1 greater than t 2. And now, let us have to begin with two reversible engines working between them. All that we say is that they are reversible. And let the efficiency of one engine be eta r 1, the efficiency of the other engine be eta r 2. Then the principal corollary of Carnot theorem, the most important one says that eta r 1 must equal eta r 2. And proving this is straightforward, all that we have to do is use the Carnot theorem twice. For example, if you consider the engine r 1 to be reversible and neglect the fact that engine r 2 is also reversible, consider r 2 to be any engine, then we will get the requirement that from Carnot theorem that eta r 2 must be less than or equal to eta r 1, because we are considering r 1 to be reversible and neglecting the reversibility possibilities of r 2. Now, consider r 2 to be a reversible engine, which is as given and neglect the fact that r 1 is also reversible. Then you will get efficiency of r 1 to be less than or equal to efficiency of r 2. So, in the first case we had efficiency of r 2 less than or equal to that of r 1. Looking at it the other way efficiency of r 1 is less than or equal to that of r 2. And hence the efficiencies of those both these conditions will be satisfied only when efficiency of r 1 is less than efficiency of r 2, uh, will be equal to efficiency of r 2. And why is this corollary important? Because that leads to the statement that the efficiency of any reversible engine working between fixed T 1, T 2 is the same I am underlining reversible engine and fixed T 1, T 2. Now, is the same means what? It is or it does not depend on the working details, working and other details of the engine. That means, materials, fluids, process details, etcetera, except that the requirement is the any engine must be a reversible engine and any engine must be working between fixed temperatures T 1 and T 2. Only then we can compare their efficiency and all such efficiencies will have to be the same. Now, we can turn this around and say that this means that efficiency of a reversible engine working between fixed temperatures is a function only of T 1 and T 2 and of nothing else. So, 
efficiency of reversible engine working reversible engine depends only on the T 1, T 2 between which it works. And notice that this is important, it does not depend on the working and other details particularly it does not depend on materials, fluids, process details, anything. The requirement is that the engine must be reversible and hence we can say that the efficiency of such a reversible engine would be a function only between T 1 and T 2. And since this relation does not depend on materials, we can say that this relation is a basic thermodynamic relation. And not a relation which is based on any materials or any process, etcetera. The only condition is remember that this R is the most important thing here. The engine must be reversible and must be working between two uh, distinct temperatures as represented by two reservoirs. Now, this brings us to a situation where using this thermodynamic relation, use this relation to set up thermodynamic scales of temperature. Why? The advantage is such scales will not depend on the properties of any material. This is important. Why is it important? Because the temperature scales which we have set up so far, Celsius scale, Fahrenheit scale, Kelvin scale, they depend on properties of some material. For example, the classical Celsius scale depended on the properties of mercury and of course, glass, because it was expected that the glass has much smaller expansion coefficient than mercury. Okay. Uh, the ideal gas Kelvin uh, scale of temperature depends on an idealized and approximated gas called an ideal gas. So, we take a real gas, use it in that zone of state space where it behaves like an ideal gas and we can measure the Kelvin temperature, Kelvin ideal gas temperature okay, or ideal gas temperature on the Kelvin scale. The attraction on the thermodynamic scales of temperature based on the fact which we will soon set up is that the efficiency of a reversible engine depends only on the temperatures between which it works and on nothing else. And hence, if we set up a temperature scale which is based on the efficiency of reversible engines, we would have set up a scale of temperature which is independent of any material. But what is the disadvantage? We have said that look, uh, number one, the simpler of the two disadvantages or less complex of the two disadvantages is that we need two constant temperature reservoirs. Okay, we can approximately create them to a very good approximation. 
but we also need a reversible engine and we have said that a reversible processes that reversible processes and a reversible engine are things about which we can only think these are thought processes and thought engines these are not real life processes and real life engines so if we set up a scale of temperature based on the characteristic of reversible engines that scale is only something with uh, which we can think about we can't really implement in practice we will live with this disadvantage for the time being but soon we will be able to show that the kelvin scale uh, based on the ideal gas equation of state has a very proper thermodynamic basis but before we do that let's look at the characteristics of thermodynamic scales of temperature let us do the following we are now going to use the fact that eta r is a function only of t1 and t2 to set up a scale of temperature and the idea would be like this if t2 is fixed as a reference we will always need that there is no such thing as absolute temperature temperature will always with respect to some reference and on some scale then t1 can be defined in terms of that means fixed temperature of some fixed state t2 that will be our fixed point then to determine some other temperature t1 all that we do is run a reversible engine between the two and the efficiency of that reversible engine can then be used to define our scale of temperature that's the basic idea we do the implementation as follows rather than talk of efficiencies we talk of something else which we will measure to determine the efficiency what we do is we go back to our now we know that the efficiency of this engine is a function only of t1 and t2 but the efficiency is defined as w by q1 using first law w will be q1 by nus q2 by q1 and this means 1 minus q2 by q1 and that means if the efficiency is a function only of t1 and t2 then my q2 by q1 will also be a function only of t1 and t2 okay so i turn it around and say that this implies that the ratio of heat absorbed from t1 to heat rejected to t2 will be some function say f is a general function to be defined as of t1 and t2 so this gives us a more detailed idea to set up a scale define t2 and reference state actually i should say reference state and t2 
reference state to n t 2. Okay. Then define f as a function and to determine t 1 major q 1 and q 2 and how do you measure q 1 and q 2? For this you will need to set up a reversible 2 T heat engine between the system whose temperature is to be measured and the reference system whose temperature is defined at T 2. And if the two systems are not reservoirs, we will have to create a reservoir at the reference temperature T 2 and create another reservoir at a reference temperature T 1. Now, if this is so, the question arises is what type of function should f be? For that, we do the following derivation. Let us say that we have three reservoirs T 1, T 2, T 3 at successively higher temperatures. That means, T 1 is greater than T 2, T 2 is greater than T 3. Now, let us work a reversible engine r 1 2 between T 1 and T 2. Let us let it absorb Q 1 by from the reservoir at T 2 and let it reject Q 2 to the reservoir at T 2. Let it produce some work say W One two. Now let us set up another reversible engine R two three between the reservoir at T two and the reservoir at T three, and let us adjust its working that it absorbs Q two. Notice this. It absorbs Q 2 from the reservoir at T 2 and rejects Q 3 to the reservoir at T 3. Let it produce some work W 2 3. Okay. Now, the question is suppose I now set up a reversible engine R 1 3, which works between the reservoirs at T 1 and T 3. And if I set it up in such a way that it absorbs heat Q 1 from the reservoir at T 1 and rejects say Q 3 prime to the reservoir at Q 3. And then let us ask ourselves the question, what is the relationship between Q 3 and Q 3 prime? A simple thought would hint to you that Q 3 must be equal to Q 3 prime and you can even prove that it must be equal to Q 3 prime because if you do not assume it to be otherwise, you will notice that you are violating the Carnot theorem or even the corollary of Carnot theorem. Okay. So, show that this is I am leaving it as a homework to you, show that Q 3 must be equal to Q 3 prime. Okay. Now, the consequence of this is that 
because q 3 is q 3 prime, I can now write q 1 by q 2 multiplied by q 2 by q 3 equal to q 1 by q 3 prime, which is equal to q 3. This prime is not really necessary. And now, we have seen that q 1 by q 2, the ratio of the heat transfers by a 2 T reversible engine is a function only of the two temperatures T 1 and T 2. We can write this as the requirement for the function f. f should be such that f of T 1 T 2 multiplied by f of T 2 T 3 must be equal to f of T 1 T 3. Any function f will do provided it satisfies this relationship. And obviously, by looking at it, we can see that one function or one type of function which would satisfy this is if we consider f to be of the type, if f is of the type some function of t 1 divided by some function of t 2. Maybe there are other possibilities, but this is definitely one possibility. And the simplest of these possibilities would be T 1 by T 2. So, remember there is nothing special, this is one possibility. If you use, if you hunt out some other type of function, we can use that, maybe it will be more complicated than a ratio, definitely. And this is the simplest of the lot. We could have considered T 1 square divided by T 2 square or logarithm of T 1 divided by logarithm of T 2, exponential of T 1 and exponential of T 2 or sin of T 1, sin of T 2, any, any complicated function you can put. But let us keep the matter simple, because if simple things lead to simple results and useful results, nothing like it. So, let us consider this to be the simplest possibility. So, the question is why not use q 1 by q 2 equal to t 1 by t 2 and q 1 by q 2 for a reversible 2 T heat engine to set up a temperature scale. And this will be a thermodynamic scale, because it will depend only on characteristics of a reversible 2 T heat engine and will not depend on the details of that engine, whether it works on air, whether it works on water, whether it works on mercury or whether it works on paper. If you can make it work as a reversible 2 T heat engine, Cardo theorem says that its efficiency between two temperatures will depend only on those two temperatures and hence we are able to use it as a basis of this temperature scale. Now, this is a uh, restricted definition of a temperature scale. The restrictions have come about or a specialization has come about, because we have decided that F will be modeled like this. And then we have selected the simplest of the possibilities that f t 1 t 2 would simply be a ratio of t 1 by t 2. And it turns out that this works beautifully and not only it turns out that this gives us a scale which is perfectly aligned with our Kelvin ideal gas scale and we will see the advantages of that later. Now, how do you implement this scale? Now, let us define a 
some thermodynamic temperature scale, but remember still we have possibility of more than one. All that we do is we set up a reference system at reference state. It could be the triple point of water, but if you are so esoteric you could have triple point of ammonia, triple point of mercury, maybe triple point of lead, depending on what is the most abundant and easily available material in your surroundings. Water is one of the most abundant and easily available material on earth. If you go to some other situation where something else is more abundant, maybe you could use the triple point or some other fixed point based on that. We have to define its temperature. T ref. Then this is a system whose temperature is to be measured. What we do if the system cannot be assumed during our experiment to behave like a reservoir, we create a reservoir at the same temperature at the system T. That we can do because that reservoir across a diathermic partition will not allow any uh, or will not have any heat interaction with our system. Okay. And then we set up a reversible 2 T heat engine between the two systems, the reference system at the reference state and the system whose temperature is to be measured. Let us say without uh, any the direction here are immaterial, it could either be both this way or it could both be this way. Let this interaction be Q reference and let this interaction be Q, the heat interaction. There will be some work done by the engine, but we uh, need not measure that or worry about it. What we do is if this is thermodynamically higher than the reference temperature, reference temperature T ref, then Q will be absorbed from our system and QR will be rejected to the reference system. If the system temperature is lower than the reference uh, temperature, then QR will be absorbed from the reference system and Q will be rejected to the system whose temperature is to be measured. But anyway, let the interactions be Q and QR and then because TR is defined and QR and QR measured, we extract our temperature T from this relation T by T ref is Q by QR. Notice the similarity of this with the definition of our ideal gas Kelvin scale. There the idea was T by T ref was PV by PV ref. For Kelvin scale we said the reference system was water, uh, a system containing water at its triple point and for convenience we had defined 273.16 Kelvin as its temperature, reference temperature. Okay. In a similar fashion, we have now defined a thermodynamic temperature scale and of course depending on whatever reference states are and what we define as T ref, we will have different scales. So, we will have to be specific about this to define a particular type of scale. But even then we appreciate the fact that we require a reversible 2T heat engine which can only be thought about not really implemented in practice. So, at this stage let me take after one hour a small break for 5 minutes, I will soon be back with you. Thank you.